one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tetrapod Zoology Podcast. My name is John Conway. I'm here with my host, Darren Age. Darren, how is it over there in Britain? I heard that Isle of Wight has sunk beneath the sea and Margaret Thatcher has risen from the grave. That sounds uh, very concerning, especially the Thatcher thing. <laughs> yes, it all goes to show that the registry files of the universe have been shifted because... I may look like uh, Darren Nash, but actually, this kind of Mission Impossible mask moment. <laughs> it's Sian Kozaman. And we are talking with Timur Sivgin on another one of our by now regular podcasts about anything weird and interesting, really. So uh, thanks to Timur for the amazing <laughs> dimension shifting registry file intro. Uh, it's a pity, though, they should do the Tetrapod Zoology podcast more often. But they recently did upload an episode. A blast from the past. But yeah. I think they're mostly, uh, like, they're all busy with their own projects. And they're mostly busy with the Tet Zoo Con, too, I think. This year, they're going to have it in real life for the first time since the pandemic. So, to yeah, our many... They haven't announced anything yet, have they? They, I, I guess they either have or are about to. I don't know. Yeah. But to our uh, millions of viewers, we really advise them to go uh, look at the Tet Zoo Con uh, event. That's T E T Z U O O C O N. Tet Zoo Con. It's, it's going to be interesting. I for sure will not be able to afford to go, but if you can, you should definitely go and visit. Okay, okay, Timur. What's on your plate? What's what's our discussion going to be well, about today? First, I have a question for our viewers that I want them to answer in the comments. Mm -hmm. Which yep. is, uh, how are we going to call this podcast? Yes, good. good. Like if we do this regularly, we should give it a proper name. But I have actually no idea. So I wanted I mean, to know what our listeners think. Yes, all all name suggestions welcome. I just call it the talk hour for now, but I mean, the name might change. Who knows? And as always, uh, please consider supporting Timur and me on Patreon.com. As, as we record right now, I'm enjoying a nice bowl of rice with yogurt and the temperature is 32 degrees or something. I'm literally overclocking the single brain cell I have got active. So, pardon me if I slur my words in the next hour or so. Mm. But today, besides the heat and all that, it's also going to be a surreal experience in another way because we had made an arrangement to talk about UFO encounters and the many strange and quite bewildering creatures people describe when they claim they were abducted by aliens. And then maybe... Our favorites or the weirdest or the most likely to be like the most realistic or scary sounding ones. So if you like UFOs, if you like aliens, if you like otherworldly encounters with otherworldly beings, you come to the right place. Oh, so, yeah. so, yeah, we actually have like a go to book uh, to discuss uh, in this podcast. Would you like to introduce it? Uh, yeah, you said you told me to download it beforehand, and it's called mm. "The Field Guide to Extraterrestrials" by an author named Patrick Huige, and it is that's, illustrated by Harry Trumbor. That's Patrick H U Y G H E and Harry T R U M B O R E. The full title is "The Field Guide to Extraterrestrials." A complete overview of alien life forms based on actual accounts and sightings. So it's a really nice book. Imagine the famous Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, but uh, done for UFO lore. It's a really nice format. I mean, they list all their sources. They they got some nice black and white illustrations. They're not extremely well detailed, and some of them are a little off the cuff, but they're all very consistent. So so nice book. What I like the most about this book is the strange uh, 
to use a present day term, the strange copium the authors unnecessarily use to begin. So it begins with almost like admitting a weakness or something, but it says, what is real? Nature lovers have their National Audubon Society field guides. Science fiction buffs have Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. And folklorists have a field guide to the little people by Nancy Arrow Smith and George Moores. But, the author says, what about the five million Americans who, as a recent Roper survey suggests, well, a recent is, I think, 1996 for this book's case, who may have been abducted by aliens. What do they have? What do the people have? Well, nothing until now. So that's how the book begins. And I mean, it's a interesting uh, way to start a book. It's, um, it was written in the 1990s. And this was peak UFO mania in, in American culture, I believe. Because it was the year when the very famous and to this day very nice movie Independence Day came out. So uh, it was like everybody was talking about UFOs and aliens. And did for you, a few, do you know when Communion came out? Was that around the same time? Communion, I think, was in the early 1990s. So it was like uh, seeding the bedrock for uh, what later blew up into the complete UFO mania. Of course, X Files had just started coming out and just was becoming like. To use another uh, contemporary term, it was popping in those days. So all of those factors came together. The internet uh, had was very rare, and it was limited to like specialists or like basically um, college people, let us say. So it was not as prevalent as then. So in the mid 1990s, there was a kind of like a proto internet phenomenon in printed media, and this kind of UFO mania was one of the driving forces in this kind of sort of counterculture, uh, new Fortean interest and flourishing, so to speak. So this book is a product of that cultural uh, millilaire. I, I dislike this word, but it's a product of that culture and that the vibe. Uh, yeah, uh, that the vibe. Product yeah. of that vibe. Yeah, it was popping because of that whole UFO vibe back then in the days. It, it's really funny because like some people who were like teenagers reading this book could might as well be the parents of the current generation who is listening to this podcast. And when I think about this, I feel really old, but I guess it's a cross-generational thing. It's like discovering your uh, father's lightsaber in the attic or something. I tried to do the Star Wars theme and I failed. A civilized weapon from a more civilized age. So this book has lots of alien creatures, but uh, like in this book or out of it, which one is like, first I'm going to ask you about which one do you think is the most likely and which one do you think is the most interesting? So... Take it I, away, Timur. I think, like, the most likely ones, honestly, I think the robotic ones <laughs> strike me as possibly being the most realistic. Well, not realistic, like, it sounds the most plausible. If, if we are talking about, like, extraterrestrial life coming from, like, very distant stars to Earth, it there is a higher likelihood that they would be machine life rather than biological life. True, very that's, true. That's the first thing. And second, the the machines that are, uh, il as, at least as they are illustrated here, look absolutely bizarre, like totally something that would be designed by non-human beings. True, true, very true. Uh, one one um, note I must add is one of the neat things about this book is that it also tries to classify the alien creatures oh, yeah. people encounter, but the classification is in a sort of almost like straight out of Pliny the Elder's natural history. So there's yeah, no more like form to... than yeah. substance. So there's two great phyla of extraterrestrials apparently: humanoid, animalian, robotic, and exotic. 
the robotic ones are the ones that Timur was just describing. And like, truth be told, there are some really bizarre uh, encounters here. So like, which one would be among the robotic kind? And also there are subtypes of these groups too. So uh, the, the class robotics uh, subdivides into metallic and fleshy robots. And there are some quite bizarre forms, but which one is your favorite? My favorite, I think it's like the, the one with like little legs. Or the tin yeah. can or the one that looks like a uh, gonk from Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. The gonk droid. <laughs> it, it even says in the text that it looks like something from Star Wars, but I was surprised and I saw the date because this thing was seen 1954, so like oh. way before Star Wars. Okay, so let's let's give an overview of this uh, quasi Star Wars robot class: robotic type, fleshy variant one. I mean, this after after the basic classes so after robotic the entire types and variants they're like completely up to the author's fancy i guess because it doesn't look fleshy at all it looks like a, a jar of mayonnaise with a little head and two big legs uh, no two short legs with big pancake like feet mm -hmm. covered with aluminum foil and it really looks like, as we talked about, so if you're into Star Wars lore, there's a character called Gonk in the Star Wars universe. It's actually a droid, and it's basically a power droid. It's basically a little generator that walks around, and people can plug their lamps in it, and it, like, it provides warmth for the whole family. I always thought it was That's a really... That's what it does. I, I always wonder what the function of the Gonk droid was. I actually never looked it up. So the Gonk droids are like basically walking generators. Huh. And it's such a like relatable and uh, cute design, and you know something that might actually be real if something like this happened. Because even in the present day, like people have this almost intimate uh, relationship with their cell phone extra charging uh, bat battery devices. You know, like oh, I forgot my battery pack. People put their cute stickers on them or whatever. So the Gonk Droid in Star Wars is basically like a battery pack that's a friend walks along with you. And but there's like a deeper layer of the gonk iceberg. So wherever you see the gonk droid in the original trilogy, it makes some like gonk, 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 la oshka, oshka, a kind of like bizarre sound bite. And this is always repeated. So diehard Star Wars fans in the like early 2000s like created this like deep lore about this droid. So basically, they said it was a joke, obviously, that Gonk was actually the most intelligent and godlike entity in the Star Wars universe. But it was just choosing to manifest itself in this humble form. And even to this day, there's, there's pages from the 1990s still extant about Star Wars lore and humor. And they just go on and on about Gonk, the savior robot, and the kingdom of heaven shielded behind blast doors. <laughs> and it's just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the blast stormy. I I love prequel memes so much. Yeah, yeah. They they really go on about the blast doors as well, and but, like. But wait, what's the gong droid even in the prequels? There are gong droids in the prequels. There like are in, in uh, Watto's workshop and during uh, the pod racing scene when they're preparing everybody. Did you, you know that? Them. Did you know that in Watto's workshop you can also see the the pod from two thousand one, a space odyssey, in the background. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, like when they, like when when Qui Gon tries to use like his Jedi mind tricks on Watto, mm -hmm. you can see it in the background on the like the junkyard. Oh, I didn't know that, but yeah, well, well maybe our work on me only money. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of feathers flew about how that was supposedly a anti-Semitic, yeah, Jewish or like a Middle Eastern stereotype, but. I guess it gets a pass because Lucas himself was Jewish. But I think was he? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, George Lucas is uh, is, a, is a Jewish creative, and also I think. Are you sure that you're not mixing that up with Steven Spielberg? That they're both Jewish. They're both okay. I think so. The deal goes uh, that basically all of these like Star Wars background aliens. I think they can relate to this like North American humor, basically. Also like 
post Ellis Island humor about the first or second generation of immigrants to the United States uh, and how America is basically a melting pot of different cultures from uh, all around the world. So, it, I mean, even if that was intended, I think like short of the like overtly extremely racist bits, I think like what they did to Ahmed Best with Jar Jar Binks was like, like in this day it wouldn't fly. But uh, like some other bits, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, the way I understood it, like apparently Watto was meant to be like a reference to a, a villain from Oliver Twist. Uh huh. George Lucas didn't realize that this character from a Victorian novel was himself a, a anti-Semitic stereotype. I mean, yes, it's like a, almost like navigating a knife's edge when you are yeah, dealing exactly. with uh, cultural nuances and creative culture so before they cancel us let's go back to <laughs> the humanoid no the robotic fleshy 1954 france uh, encounter so this actually took place in a le droid de gong <laughs> the, the, le droid de gong at uh, i don't know french i think you have much better French. Than I had I. French for seven years in school because this is Switzerland. Yeah, it's one of our national languages, and I can't speak it anymore. It's so I hate this language so much. Actually, I think it's like like when when I read high French, like um, the French they write in Le Monde or something. Like they even make it rhyme. It's a, such a sublime language. And when I'm researching other things, like there's like so much written in France. Or Italian or German in or in other in all of these like non English European languages, there's like a universe of information out there, and it's one of those uh, languages I wish I knew how to speak fluently. You you don't want to <laughs> believe me. You don't want to learn this language. I hated it. I I, abs- I like uh, towards the end of my school years, I ate my French books out of pure spite. I like I bit into them. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I hear the numbers are quite crazy. Oh, like, yeah, those are, like, yeah, in, like instead of having a distinctive word for 80, they say, like, 20, no, 2 times 40 or something like that. And then you I, have to add another number if you want to say, like, 83. <laughs> I used to joke around uh, having uh, about French, the French language having been invented by creatures with uh, regenerative digit numbers. Or like uh, ichthyos, or like extreme polydactyly, because the, the numbers are not in base five. So that's that is very strange. The funny thing, you know, like you know, you know how like um, there is a distinct dialect of German in Switzerland, Swiss German. Mm-hmm, there there mm-hmm. used to be also a distinct Swiss dialect of French, and there they actually did have uh, distinct mm. numbers for like 80, 90 and 70 and I mean words like Vuitton and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for example but then like the Académie Française for some reason like reached over into Switzerland and forced the schools to to, ev- to make everyone learn like the standard French that is spoken oh. in France and it actually like destroyed many like many French dialects in Switzerland have now gone gone extinct because of this Wow, I mean, this one thing that many people don't know that the French, there's like a really serious international agency that manages and oversees the French language. Yeah, the Académie Française. Yes, yes. And I think this is one of the most neat things about uh, France itself. Like in terms of the but of course their reach is not limited. I mean, it, it cannot go over to Turks in Germany or Turks in Switzerland and say, no, 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 you're going to have to use this from now on. But this is one of the like amazing, interesting things about France, basically. So I, they also... I have a friend, wait, I have a friend who studies uh, linguistics and she hates the Académie Française because first there is like literally no one that is actually a French linguist on their board. Hmm. The second one, like I told you, they actively want local dialects to go extinct. That's bizarre, and it's something I did not know. It's just like a French supremacist, basically. Oh, I mean, 
Yeah, but going back to unusual uh, Swiss linguistic details, was there also not like an indigenous Swiss language that's completely distinct from the German, French, and Italian spoken there? It, it, hey, it's still alive. It's called uh, Retromanisch. It, yes, yes. It's basically, yeah, it's, it, when you see it, it's kind of similar to Italian, but it's it distinctly evolved independently out of Latin. Hmm. I mean, man, it's one of the nicer things about Switzerland. That yeah. Recently, yeah. there was actually a horror game entirely in that language made by some indie team, but I don't know wow. the name anymore. What's the plot about? Ah, like if any, anyone like knows some... it, mention it in the comments. Yeah. Like some guy goes into like the Swiss mountains where there's a great romance and it's haunted, basically. Like a typical horror game, but I mean, mm. that's the unique thing that it was made in this extremely obscure language. Was uh, HR Giger any inspiration for this? Because for the game, he, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So he's one of the like OG Swiss people out there. Much respect. Okay, okay. We uh, this is what this is what I really liked about our show that we spin off into tangent from tangent from tangent, but. Uh, to, to loop back onto the robot, so let me just briefly uh, read the encounter uh, and then we can uh, discuss it further. Basically, this was one of the most famous events from the French UFO wave of 1954, it says. And it's actually the source is a really neat author, Jacques Wallet. I'm butchering his name, but it's V A L L E E. And this author wrote so many books about basically Fortean events with a European perspective. So I really recommend looking into his works as well. So anyways, at 10.30 p.m., the witness stepped outside of his house in, in a small town on the Belgian border. The town is uh, Quarouble, or I don't know how to spell this, Quarouble, North France. Quarouble. And, so, and so a dark mass sitting on the railroad tracks. So this was a choo-choo train UFO. So when he heard footsteps, he turned around, he turned on the house lights and was confronted by two very small beings, less than four feet tall, wearing very large helmets and heavy diving suits. So, and he did not see any arms on them. So a local artist drew this depiction and that's why we have the kind of like uh, Star Wars droid kind of entity described here. And actually, if you look at the video description image, you can also see uh, an image of this beast. So they came on a train. How amazing. Train UFO people. <laughs> so he moved towards them. But suddenly, the craft shot a green ray from uh, like, and paralyzed them. So we know that these train uh, jar UFO R2D2 aliens were also masters of combined arms warfare because they have the infantry and then they have got the armored fighting vehicle on the train tracks, but they're working in coordination. So the vehicle is covering the infantry. So it's so, like a fort, like that's the, it's the new 40k faction. Yes, and the most overpowered than chaos the... conks. <laughs> chaos. Okay. Uh, the, with the ability to paralyze any, anyone and everyone. I want actually a game like a uh, squad, but with these entities. So everything is very, very, very realistic. The graphics are extremely realistic and like low saturation, but you're working as one of, uh, you can pilot the train UFO and shoot green beams. But of course, to, to pilot the UFO, you have to like take 80 hours of piloting lessons because it's a very realistic milit milsim, UFO milsim. That's <laughs> so. Anyways, what happened? What happened? Then the then the craft just sat there. But by the time the guy gained mobility, the entities was gone. Gone. Entities were gone, and the craft had begun to rise from the railroad tracks. Now, four days later, the French uh, air force came knocking, and they talked with this guy and examined the site, and they discovered no trace of the entities, no trace of the combined armed warfare milsim train UFO. But they did find marks on the wooden railroad sleepers indicating that the heavy object had rested on them. Never mind that probably like throughout decades, like 
hundreds of trains could have stopped in this location, especially if it's on the border. But no, it was a heavy object that was something else. So they, they consulted with railroad engineers and they concluded that a weight of 30 tons must have rested there. Probably the same weight as a locomotive, but anyways. Uh, so maybe these were uh, like evidence of the UFO's landing gear. And something strange had taken place that night. Now, this is the author's uh, prose coming into force. Something strange had taken place that night. Where the five marks had been found on the railroad ties, the roadbed gravel was notably brittle, as if calcinated at high temperatures. Further confirmation came from several inhabitants of the region who had seen a reddish light travel across the sky about the same time. So, okay, it was not a train because something had carbonized the stones. I don't know. What do you, what do you think of it, Timur? What's your opinion about this whole, whole shebang? Honestly, I don't know much, but I find it interesting that the witness, it says in the first sentence that he was a metal worker. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting that when he sees something paranormal, he interprets it in like in a very mechanic way. Yeah, yeah. But also, going back to what you said about these being the most realistic aliens out there. Well, you know, I wouldn't many... say that. I just found it the most interesting out of these songs. No, I also believe that they are extremely realistic because, I mean, it's like uh, combining today's Boston Dynamics technology with the Mars probes or that is uh, true, yeah. the Voyager craft and just letting it advance for another century or maybe. I mean, the only thing that's kind of silly about this story is the green paralysis beam. I mean, that's like straight out of science fiction movies yes. or literature. And it's also in many of the stories in this book that it's like a... Which, I, of course, you could take that as evidence. Aha, there's a commonality there. But also, it's mm. just very convenient to say, hey, before this guy actually, like, touched or took some physical evidence, the aliens always paralyze him. <laughs> very, very true. Strongest Warhammer faction. But also, I mean, if, like, the entity actually makes, like, perfect sense because it, it's something that can navigate uh, rough terrain with, because the wheels are a risk and you can flip over. The UFO, okay, it also makes sense. Maybe it's the landing craft or whatever. I mean, we'll ignore if it came from like a interstellar planet or maybe it came from Mars, wherever. But I mean, it would make sense. Like if there was another Earth in our solar system and it, the people there were like two centuries ahead of us, so not much. I mean, it would make sense for something like this to land. The only exception is, as we, as we just discussed, the, the paralysis beam then it would be something like, if it was like really, really what it said it was about, it would have to be like one of today's uh, acoustic population control weapons. They're, they're horrible things. Like, So you don't even understand where the sound is coming from. You don't see a light. You don't see nothing. But you just have this kind of killer splitting headache. And if you're dehydrated, you pass out. Basically, like they're directing microwaves to kind of really like, clear you of the area i mean oh by the way do you know about this cuban noise incident that have been taking place since the like last five years uh, like the big like a, there's like a big sound in the sky and nobody knows where it comes from uh it's similar it's like there's a sound like cicadas it it only uh, the only people who encounter it are embassy workers in cuba who are from Western countries like Canada, US, UK, wherever. And they all uh, report these strange um, headaches and even something like brain damage. So actually there was like a serious uh, American Department of Defense investigation on this matter. And they maybe said maybe somebody's using a directed uh, microwave weapon against these people. That actually sounds very plausible. Like yeah, yeah. If you like a decade or so ago, when I was in school, we went on a field trip to Berlin, mm -hmm. and there we visited um, a Stasi, like a a former Stasi uh, prison that had been turned into a museum after mm -hmm. the the wall fell in the Berlin mm -hmm. Wall, and apparently, mm -hmm. and there was a case of like 
they, they took prisoners who usually were just political dissenters. Mm-hmm. They sat them on a chair and let them sit there for like two hours while interrogating them. Mm-hmm. And the people who sat on this chair usually died from like cancer or related things. And then like uh-huh. after the, 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 they closed the prison and examined everything, they found mm-hmm. out that behind the wall of this, behind the, like behind the wall, behind the chair, yeah, yeah, was like some radioactive beam device. Oh fuck! That, that like shot them right in the head, without them noticing. Why would anyone do this? I mean, I mean it's, it's, even... the, it's the Stasi, like the the the, the state police of the uh, of East Germany, which by many accounts was even worse than the Gestapo of Nazi mm-hmm. Germany. I mean, I heard pretty awful things about them, but like. Uh, even from like, so imagine like you're really badass and like, like you're really like uh, like all out. Doesn't really make sense because like, is it an interrogation device or I maybe those? Okay, it it makes a perverted sense of uh, it makes a perverted sense of logic. Like if they want to like eliminate these people, but for legal reasons they could not do it. So it's a kind of plausible deniability. Weapon. Okay, well, wow, really awful stuff. Oh, oops! Too bad we stored yeah. the uranium in the walls. We didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Plausible deniability. But awful. <laughs> but imagine if, like, I ran up. Oops! Where did those nukes come from? I remember also in the U.S. there was a kind of uh, domestic terror plot uh, foiled by the FBI or something, and in this case the attackers were, uh, I would say, maybe let's say, extreme right-wing supremacists, and like they were like extreme educated people. I think one of them was even like a, a dentist or a radiation oncologist. So these two people had like come together and tried to build this uh, directed radiation weapon, which is really crude. They basically salvaged uh, like the radioactive material from a, an old MRI scanner or something. And they put it basically in a lead pipe with lead shutters. And their plan was to like bring this weapon to speaking events where like basically Muslim speakers or left wing speakers were attending. And they would like open the lead shutters and like beam them up, like slowly expose them to radiation. So, yeah, but, but... Wow. yeah. I mean. There's there's a nice nice uh, a phrase in Churchill's speeches that I never forget. Made all the worse by in the by the light of perverted science, he says, and this is really like a perverted science. Yeah, it sounds, and, and, <laughs> sounds like a fallout weapon almost, just very uh, slow. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, with radiation weapons, they're like slow weapons, so they don't make for a good story, but. They like, but I mean, they're terrifying because you can't see or feel them initially, or mm-hmm. you only notice what happened after when you're already dying from cancer. Also, there was this like amazing Brazilian uh, n- nuclear uh, nuclear waste bus ride incident. Do you know about that? Nu- what? No. So in Brazil, I-, I might be mistaken. Maybe it's Mexico or Brazil. In either one of these countries. Somehow, uh, an MRI scanner was not disposed of cleanly, so the radioactive material also actually went into a metal scrapyard. So the the local scrapyard owners, kids played with these like shiny little metals for oh. days, and then what happened was like the guy thought maybe I could sell this somewhere, so he put it in a plastic bag and carried in carried it with him on like two consecutive bus rides. Oh. To the to to the metal assessor's place, oh. and then like he also like kept it at home for a couple of days, and like maybe showed it to some neighbors. So it turns out like hundreds of people, like those people on the bus, for example, were exposed to like dangerous levels of radiation, and some of them developed cancer or something. It's really like scary stuff. That's damn. No, yeah, it yeah. reminds me of uh, there was this, you know, like this one Genghis Khan movie from the fifties, where Genghis Khan was played by John Wayne of all people, and well, natural, natural, okay. Yeah, and the, 
that's not what caused the cancer. It could have, but uh, <laughs> um, basically they filmed the whole movie in a desert where previously the U- United States had done nuclear testing. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone who worked on the movie developed cancer. Except, except, for except maybe for John Wayne for some reason, because I think he's uh, demonic. He's protected by star, star power. There was a similar story in the uh, Eastern book as well. Um, there's this really nice um, Tarkovsky film called Stalker. The, the, even the I soundtrack. still want to see that. I still haven't watched, but I want to see that. Same here. I listened to its soundtrack. The soundtrack is amazing. They play the uh, they play the Ney or the Duduk. Uh, the Armenians call it Duduk. The Turks call it Ney. It's basically like this. Like you and I would know this reed instrument. <laughs> But uh, Tarkovsky played it, had it played in a kind of science fiction type way. It's, it's really beautiful. Anyways, this movie, they had to have these like bizarre sci-fi uh, landscapes, let us say. And of course, what better place to have these in a, than an abandoned factory somewhere near the Caspian Sea. So everybody involved with the production came up with some sort of chemical poisoning or like life-shortening ailment or something, but Talk about suffering for art. Mm. Hello, hello, hello. We seem to be experiencing a sound problem with Timur. Are you there? Why? No, I'm still here. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, no. oh, I-, I thought you had broken off for a moment. Oh, or... no, no. That was my phone hey, hitting the couch. Ah, okay, okay. I thought the radiation beam green paralysis beam yeah. got you for a second wait. well wait something just said oh it's a oh it's a robot I still, ah, ah. <laughs> <There's> no <laughs> i'm gonna use this from now on like when i drop out of a meeting or a call or something <laughs> i'll just stay silent then like half an hour later you know strangest thing happened <laughs> yeah. le, le droid the gong. <laughs> okay so that was your uh favorite uh, alien any other comments on this amazing amazing beast yeah, I mean, like I said, it's interesting that this came out before Star Wars and but ended up looking kind of like those droids. Mm-hmm, so then again, I think that there's a bunch of sci-fi movies in the 50s where they did depict robots kind of like this. Like, for example, yeah. Lost, I think Lost Planet had like a, had a robot that had very similar legs because it was being played by a guy in a suit. Yeah, I think the guy in a suit thing certainly leads to certain limitations. What I also find very interesting here is that um, Air Force investigators came around. So at the time they must have been taking it seriously. Yeah, like did did the Air Force come to him like on their own or did he call them? I think they came to them on their own, 1950s. Yeah, that is interesting. This was also the time, I must add, that French were making the most amazing aircraft uh, with their aircraft industry. Early 1950s, they had this like creative renaissance. So they built all these like cylindrical wing ramjet airplanes or like these bizarre like basically they had these aviational concepts that were too advanced for the material engineering of their time. But there's like these amazing Coleopter aircraft, for example. Anyways, if anyone in the chat knows, they know. So, let's let's go review another creature from this amazing book. Yeah, what is your favorite one? My favorite one appears in the later section. Exotic. The exotic section, yes. Yeah. I, I think you can already guess. It's the one with... Uh, it's, it's called Class Exotic Type Apparitional. It took place in Riverside, California. So it's this bizarre creature that looks like a fetus. Yeah, with, right. Ooh. With four legs and uh, four limbs that split into two. And it had uh, two eyes and also four diamond-shaped things where his nose should be. But this depiction always reminded me of the eyes of spiders because they have some similar arrangement. Mm-hmm. So there's the two big eyes. And below the two big eyes, there's like diamond-like smaller red eyes. So I'll just give a quick summary. At two in the afternoon in Riverside, California, a group of children were playing in the yard of the Douglas family. 
while Kermit and other children were wrestling. So... <laughs> I didn't notice that while reading this guy's name's Kermit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I didn't realize in all witnesses were kids. I guess it shows how rich children's imaginations can be. But anyways... Yeah, you talked about this in your snail video. <laughs> yeah. There's like a bunch of UFO sightings on schoolyards. Yeah, yeah. Which think... probably has more to do with the imagination of children than aliens being interested in kiddies. Yeah, true, true. Also, God, imagine if that if the, the second option were true. That would be creepy. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Alien I versus mean... predator would have a whole new meaning. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, let us... Let us not go there because already in the present day and age, this kind of pedophile conspiracies are uh, gaining notorious traction in certain quarters. Oh, uh, yeah. You throw UFOs in there. <laughs> you, know, you might already have given some uh, QAnon types some ideas. Uh, I Like, I bet the things that they already have come up with, we, would, we could never, like, uh, outdo. Oh, yes. But, yeah, yes. let's continue. Yeah, yeah, let's continue. So, okay, this could classify as one of the, another one of those school year encounters, though uh, exactly it didn't take place at school, but uh, only the kids got to see this, see this horrifying monstrosity. So then Kermit noticed some uh, an aircraft that looked like half a sun in the air above them. And after then it disappeared, and then a silver disc appeared. But Kermit is having some, like, St. John of Patmos type of apocalyptic visions right here. So the kids notice the object and others, they're like, ah, look, look. So it's amazing. The kids are playing. First, the half sun UFO appears. Then a silver disc appears. But the kids are still playing. Then it, then for some reason, they take interest. Now, ah, okay, there's these UFOs around. All right. What at first seemed like fun began to frighten the children. One of the objects, which bore a bright light on its antenna, landed in a field not far from it. So it's an entire fleet. The children saw a three and a half foot tall being emerge from the craft. And it was this creature. It basically looks like this floating fetus with divided arms and four legs. But the legs look like the jointed sections of a or joint twin, basically. The, but it also looks like a, like a hand with fingers. Oh, true, think? true. I think that's just the illustrator's like yeah. stylized because it says the the creature was like floating in the air. So, but it really, it's it really is bizarre. Okay, then there is another creature that's not illustrated. So this is like a whole complex of. Okay, so you got the half sun UFO, you got the silver disc UFO, then you got another UFO with a bright light on its antenna. It's not specified if this is the silver craft or something else. So I'm just uh, reporting it as a third craft. Then from this, you have the scary split limb creature. But then they also see another transparent entity. And this entity was the size of a child in front of the house next door. And the child, transparent child, also had the diamond-like extra eye spots on its face. The boys insisted that the creature was not standing on the ground, but hovering above it. But And then another boy saw an arm suspended in the air, beckoning to him. This is like, you know, there's an uh, Old Testament legend about this. Basically, it was like some uh, unruly king or lord was oppressing the Jews. And like just, and just as he was having his banquet, a, a mysterious hand appeared out of nowhere. And the hand wrote a uh, portentous uh, writing with his finger. And I, I don't remember exactly the name of the legend or what the hand wrote, but it's very clear in my head. So this is like some Old Testament or like some New Testament apocalyptic stuff yeah. going down right here. So, I mean, it's really it's scary. Like if you take this at face value, imagine seeing this as a child. Then the strangest creature which I think is the third creature, okay. Then the strangest creature came and spoke to one of the boys. Fear not. Well, he didn't say this, but I think this is exactly what it would say. It was solid looking and wore satin-like clothing. It didn't, 
it it also had these four legs and double forearms, uh, like the one I described. It's not clear if this is the first entity. I don't know. The writing style in this book is it leaves some things to be desired. So I'm just being really uh, pedantic and registering every entity as a separate entity. But I guess he's talking about one creature or two. I don't know. So anyways, the creature came and started speaking. Fear not, children. And just climbed into a nearby tree where in about 15 minutes, I will come and pick him up. Okay, Timur, this sounds like this kind of... Uh, pedophilia alien. Yeah, exactly. Like, in 15 minutes, I will come and pick you up. So the boy, without questioning, it says he, but we don't know if this is Kermit or one of the seven other children in this story. He climbed uh, with another boy, but then the other children were, no, come back. You're not doing the right thing. Come down. And so they had to hose them down with a garden hose. Uh, so this was really lucky because a few minutes later a bright UFO came to this particular tree but seeing there were no children to be harvested it just disappeared okay then the investigators studying this uh, story this is very portentous felt that the children who were frightened for long afterward told the truth whatever that may be I mean, it's just a... Yeah. I mean, first of all, I think it's a multiple clusterfuck. It's a case of bad reporting right? because the source comes from something they call a, a magazine called, a, a reputable magazine called the Flying Saucer Review, uh, 1967. Extraordinary happenings at Casablanca in Riverside, California, 1951 at the height of the uh, pulp sci-fi movie uh, epidemic. It's kind of like... Yeah, also the, the surprising. Cold War. Yeah, yeah, also, also the, the Cold, Cold War. War. That's why it looks so, probably so apocalyptic, because many people fit, thought that the world was going to end soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just those duck and cover days, huh? Yeah, exactly. Have you watched The Iron Giant? No, no, but I've... I've heard good things about it's it. It's a very good animated movie. I don't know which studio made it in, but anyway, it's like it perfectly it encapsulates the feel of that time. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I will give it a watch. I mean, so it was just those years. And so but first of all there's bad reporting like and then I'm 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 really sorry to the author of this book. It's still a great book. So uh Patrick Hugh, if you're listening to this, uh, you wrote a great book and for decades afterwards, it keeps inspiring us and uh, like gets our noggins jogging. So, like, no, I'm not throwing any shade on you there. But, man, the way you wrote this piece, you know, it's not very clear. The same boy, he, 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 is repeated three times, but there's seven boys. Is it Kermit or is one of the other boys? Are there three craft or one or two? Are there two entities or three? Which one is wearing the satin clothing? Satin clothing is also, like, I mean, particularly interesting thing to notice. Also, like, straight out of, like, these, like, weird tales kind of stuff, too. So, I don't know, Timur, what do you think about this this incident right here? Yeah. Like I said, I think it's probably just some children having a very nice imagination. But it did make me think, you know, you know what? When we talk about alien abductions, and mm -hmm. let's imagine if those are real, mm -hmm. then we have must have a massive survivorship bias because you only hear abduction accounts from people who came back. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah. But what if there are a bunch of aliens who just take you and never bring you back? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, then <laughs> this book states that five million. Americans have been, and Americans alone, I mean, five million in America alone, who, who knows, God knows how many in India or China, especially in the 1990s, where, when those countries were not very open to the world. So maybe there is like, for five million abductees, there's hundreds of millions more, like, or like 10 million, who didn't just make it back from the experiment. Yeah. There is actually a science fiction book about this. Like, you know, so all those missing people, all those dead people. And in this book, they also notice like a, an enormous amount of people who just go missing in wars. 
and they're not uh, they're just MIA they're not confirmed that so it turns out in this book which is a science fiction book it's called the plague of demons by Frederick Pohl I believe so uh, it turns out actually this alien race is secretly harvesting people from battlefields and like missing people reports from all over the world and in general like these, these reports of people who just out of nowhere go missing they scare me so much man i mean yeah same i mean even without even without uh, any supernatural or ufo related explanation i mean i remember a, a police officer talking somewhere like and he was telling that let's say like there are crimes that get committed there are crimes that get revealed out of the crimes that get revealed to a second person that's say or a third part person there are the crimes that get reported and from the crimes that get reported there are the crimes that uh, the police take up and from the crimes that the police take up there are the crimes that uh, get solved so it's like a cascade of uh, mystery and even in the present day i think especially in in uh, like urban or non urban parts of the world a lot of murders just go unsolved in fact i might just i mean go out on a limb to say that like there there probably are these people who know how to kill and like disappear someone and this this trade let's say has some pretty basic life hacks and if you know how to do it you just never get caught also there must be lots of cases where like somebody is just lucky and the crime never gets reported yeah like oh. like in breaking bad where walter's bro- uh, brother-in-law is straight up a dea agent but it takes like five seasons for him to find out <laughs> that, that he's cooking meth <laughs> true true i think in the present day this has been corrected somehow because everybody has a smartphone and if they go online people go looking for them but still i mean in the rural parts of the world it must be a whole other story i wait, remember wait, i remember wait, wait, wait. Sorry. sorry i want to add something i'm going go on like a few months ago there i saw this map once where they showed showed like um like an event map of like all the missing people across the United States that are still mm-hmm. missing. Mm-hmm. And then they overlay that map with a map of like extensive cave systems in the United States. Oh, shit. And it was almost an exact match. Ah, true. And of course you can think all sorts of creepy stuff about if you want to if you want to correlate that, you can think of so much creepy stuff. Like, why do people go missing in places where there are a lot of caves? Do they just go in there or does something come out and get them? <laughs> Usually, well, I think though, like, most of the record is full of animals that got trapped in caves and died. So it's probably the boring explanation, but it doesn't make sense. But we're talking about humans. Yeah, okay, well, so... we're all, they're all stupid, but. Actually, it's in, incredibly easy to get lost in a cave because there's no light. Incredibly easy. I mean, I mean, there are many like you get lost. The cave system is like you don't remember the way you go. You go in, and and also like cave is and the caves are not like built like buildings. So like if you go in a building, you can be sure that the building has a front, back, or and sides. But the cave has like weird corridors, and it also its whole orientation shifts subtly. So. You think you're going like this way, but you're actually going the other way subtly. And there's no light and like like the total absence of light is such a disorienting factor. But so I can like, I I mean, I predict that a lot of people just go in there and die of thirst. That's it. I hope that's, I hope that's that's the the case. case. Any other alternative is probably creepier. Oh, not, not that like there's a, this is the movie Descent. Yeah, this exactly. That's what I was thinking of. Blind, echolocating Neanderthals. But those were so specialized for cave life that they probably could not wander out. I mean, you had to go into their place to run into some troubles. Also, also about this, like, uh, about this whole bizarre uh, vision thing, I think it once again reminds me of uh, childhood's end because i mean children have the creepiest imaginations because they are not limited by logic or reason 
they just string along the bits that they think makes the best or the most scary story. So like, it's like even assuming that this is like totally made up by the children, which is I guess ninety five percent the case. Uh, the other five percent being someone maybe slipped them a, a glass of acid in orange juice or something. But like supposing that they made this up, there are so many themes. Like there's a sense of urgency. The the like two kids get brainwashed. There's this kind of demonic beckoning. There are these portents. There's foreshadowing. God, motherfuckers got foreshadowing in the story. And it's, it comes in acts. Like the first act is the UFO sighting. Second act is the apparition, apparitions. Third act is the uh, the threat, the, the call up to the tree and the way they uh, convince their friend not to go up there. I mean, kids are already better writers than half of the people working at Disney right now. Yeah, now that now that I think about it, it does sound, you know, like, like a more realistic tale. If, like, creepy people come up to you and want to pick you up, just say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, like, true. Okay. Especially, especially if they have diamonds on their face and split arms and they yeah, were... That, that's they the were, bonus, yeah. They were sucking clothing. Things. They were sucking clothing in the California heat. <laughs> All right. Speaking of the heat... How long has it been? I think we have time for one more entity. So I'll let should you I, wait, Should I tell you about my favorite UFO encounter, but it's not from this book? Please, please do so. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the one-footed snorkel monster? Ooh. I know the one-footed pineapple monsters that they're also in this book, but no, not the snorkel monster. So this is the first time I heard about this was, I think, when I was like 13 and watching an episode of Ancient Aliens, because mm-hmm. back then I was really into that stuff. Like, I, I even attended a live lecture by Erich von Däniken. Uh, what was he talking about? Just uh, Yeah, well, his regular stuff, like, it was such a bizarre coincidence, because he was holding a lecture in a hotel in the mm-hmm. village right next to mine. Oh, so of yeah. course I, I went there because I was like very much into like conspiracy stuff back then. Today I'm very skeptical about all that. Still doesn't and, make it any less enjoyable. Yeah, it, it is very interesting. I barely remember what he was talking about. It was like like this basic stuff, you know, like the Mayan calendar and mm-hmm. how like the impossibility of pyramids and stuff, you know. Ah, so anyway, he was given the like regular talk, yes. Yeah. Anyway. So I, in in this episode, it was like they tried linking like ancient accounts of sea monsters to uh, mm-hmm. UFOs and USOs, which are like UFOs underwater. <laughs> and they they t- tell this one account of an alien encounter, and I actually found like an online transcript here. Mm-hmm. So it's a guy living in Alabama, mm-hmm. just sleeping in his house or I think van or something. And then mm-hmm. he hears something like trembling on the on the roof. Let, let me like replicate it, like yeah, sort of like yeah, something yeah. like first he thinks it's just rain, but they, then it keeps getting louder and louder, and mm-hmm. then he thinks someone is on my roof. So he goes out the door, mm-hmm. and then like standing in front of him is the thing that he can only describe as a one-footed snorkel monster. <laughs> because the whole entity is just this like single headless proboscis attached oh, no. to an elephant, a single elephant like foot. It looks like somebody's spore creature they did as exactly. A and apparently <laughs> then this creature like jumps around his garden and mm-hmm. is like chased by a, a beam of light. Oh, no. It's and, really like straight out of spore. Yeah. And then the beam of light hits the and it, it hits the creature. And mm-hmm. the creature like goes a bit, a few feet up in the air, and then it mm-hmm. tr- starts to spin. And mm-hmm. as it spins, it creates a portal and goes inside the portal, and then it vanishes. No, yeah, Snorky, no. I love it. <laughs> yeah, basically, and the only reason why they had that thing in the episode is mm-hmm. because they tried to link it to the Loch Ness monster somehow. Well, wow, that's a stretch of imagination, but at least make it a charismatic creature, you know, like some reptile alien or something. But... Yeah, yeah. Like in the, they actually animated it in the episode and they gave it flippers to make the connection clearer. 
even though in the original description the, the creature doesn't have limbs i mean this is the this is the first time i've heard of this thing and uh, to uh, to your honor i will do the following i will include this picture in the video link this video image so if you're viewing this you can already see it i will also draw this creature and hand it over to timur for him to display on his uh, patreon so if you support yeah, timur thank you timur on patreon even for a dollar you can see snorky the abducted abducted alien creature also if you support me on patreon you'll also get to see a lots of cool free stuff but for this show i'm just going to uh, like uh, i'm just going to share it with your fans let's say okay <laughs> thank you snorky the alien so i think we got time for one more creature from this book uh, why don't you choose it actually uh why don't you choose it for uh, 30 seconds while i go and fulfill a, a an irrefusible call of nature so i'll just be back very soon and you choose your favorite creature okay and... i will i will entertain our listeners in the meantime okay be right back so uh... What could we do? What could we, alien, could we look at? Mm. There's Nordics. Mm, no. Elder. No. Elvis. Hmm, maybe. Grace. Boring. This one looks like the Michelin Man. This one. That. Mm, there's an alien that legit looks like Kermit here. Uh, no. No, 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 Mm. A black gray. Wait, no, that's an oxymoron. Oh, I had such a horrible experience. What I happened? Hit by a green beam of light straight up from the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. It was, it, memo, it was in the urinal. <laughs> it was... It was. I actually disrespected our first intergalactic encounter. Yeah, imagine how, imagine how unfortunate that would be. Like the first alien we encounter, and it's like a robot shaped like a toilet, and we just keep making fun of it. Or someone urinates in it, but hey, no king shaming, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, I. Why, well, Thought we could talk about page eighty-eight, the amphibian. Oh right, the All one right. with the Ooh. eyes. I love that one. I love that design. This this creature is amazing. I actually, uh, well, it can be made official now. I am in the research research phase for a new uh, pan cryptid video. This time based on um, this time based on frog-like creatures. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. I love that. So. Any suggestions for frog cryptids below the comments? They're very welcome. Also, if you want to watch this uh, video and get the get the presentation, subscribe to my channel as well. Also, this these aliens they're part of like an enormous bigger story that's far scarier because they were just like they they are not the main creatures themselves. Yeah. Okay. So so if you want, let me just uh, go with the summary here. Yes. Uh, by the way, all the creatures we talked about it about today in this book or out of it, they are like straight up. They all look like somebody shit posting with spore. This creature included. But anyways, anyways, class animalian, type amphibian, variant two. Name I don't know. Kermit. <laughs> really? No. no. 
No, no, no. This time the witness name is Betty Andreasson. I think this lady is famous because she has a lot of uh, UFO experiences in in various books. So anyway. Oh, so kind of like a Damski. Yeah, yeah, like because a lady. She also talks about like very angelic aliens. Yeah, 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 exactly. I remember like pictures from one of her books and they were like all, I mean, I, I, I think it was like very neat illustration of the uh, male versus female experience of aliens that like all aliens in this Andrea Son case, they were like very angelic, beautiful, ethereal and the drawing style was very like, uh, dare I say, feminine and delicate and very fine lines. Anyways, uh, let's go, let's go. So it all began at 6.35 p.m. When the house lights went out briefly, this is, I'm re- I feel like I'm reading a Stephen King book already. Betty Andreasson was in the kitchen while her seven children and her mother and father were in the living room. I mean, one thing I, I admire about these old stories that take, be, be, take place before 1970 is how big families people have and how, uh, how calmly and uh, how chill everyone gets along with each other. I mean, in this day and age, I cannot imagine living together with uh, seven children. I mean, we cannot even uh, conceive of having one. But also living together with your mom and dad, like even if we had like the millions of uh, liras or dollars that would be necessary to properly raise a kid today or seven kids today, with, with the parents, the generations would just end up killing each, each other. So with, like, back on those days, was something else. I mean, people were, I guess, either more amicable or just more resilient about intrafamilial trauma. Anyways. I could make some big ass rant about how capitalism has destroyed the family structure, but that's not what we're, what oh, we're true, here for true. today. No, I, I would like, uh, I mean, after 1970, it kind of like this uh, boomer generation culture went into maximum overdrive. But suddenly you had to like, uh, and then it really, really went bad after uh, the Thatcher and Reagan years. And it didn't help that every president and prime minister in the UK and the US and in Europe, no matter if they were left, right, doesn't even matter. They did what they could to um, transfer all the agency out of people's hands into companies' hands. And I don't know, there will be retribution. But anyways... (laughs) Okay, okay, so back to our idyllic scene. Okay, the big family is in the house. Mammy and Pappy are in the living room. Seven kids are sleeping and farting. 6.35 p.m. Okay, so it's not in the morning. She's in the living room. Suddenly the lights flicker. But then, there's a pulsing orange light streaming in through the kitchen window. And she went in to calm the children. Like, kids, don't be scared. Then went back to the window. And then, with her father, Betty Andreasson, saw five uh, creatures leaping like grasshoppers towards the house. We don't also know if they look like grasshoppers, but I I wish they did. It would be something like uh, like something out of a Jack Vance story with these like insect aliens jumping towards the whole house uh, in tune with the pulsation of the bright orange light. So then they pass through the door as if it wasn't even there. These are all interdimensional creatures. The one we just discussed was also like, uh, like they're all interdimensional creatures, apparently. They, they pass through the wall. The, everyone blacks out, except for Betty. So like, it's like nine or ten people in the house. Everyone like, ah, faints, except for Betty. Then, years later, she ri- realized what happened because she underwent hypnosis. So the leading grasshopper jumping door vibrating orange light alien says my name is Quazga like when now they mention the grasshopper in my mind these creatures always sound like uh, Geonosians from Star Wars I love your Geonosian voice can you do it again yes yes so the alien said my name is and then all the beings we're about four feet tall. Uh, we're really in the short person syndrome uh, role today, anyways. Wore blue clothes and had pear-shaped heads with wrap-around cat-like eyes. 
So they kind of look like gray aliens, but with a more human uh, complexion, let's say, because they wear clothes and everything. And their eyes are so big, they wrap around the four corners of their skull. Very scary. And on their sleeves was the insignia of a bird, a free bird clan, jumping through your door. Anyways, then Betty said, you know, I'm concerned for my family. This is like such a nice, a good, good example of the, like in a good way, good example of the female perspective. Because if this was a guy, like he would be getting anal probe right here. But no, here she's very calm, even though half her family has been knocked uh, unconscious. And this Kwasga alien comes and she's like, look, I'm concerned for my family. So they're like, okay, release the daughter. And then suddenly the 11 year old daughter uh, suddenly regained consciousness. So apparently these creatures could uh, like basically switch people on and off from the server side of things, maybe up in heaven. I don't know. One of the aliens was really nice. He started like juggling balls of light with this 11 year old kid just to calm her down. And Betty was, did the righteous thing and gave Kwasga, the elder, a Bible. And he handed her a blue book. And this blue book was the Project Blue Book. No, it wasn't. It's, he just gives her a blue book. We don't know what it is, but you know, it's one of those books I would like to give maybe my little digit to read. Anyways, it reminds me of the Betty and Barney Hill encounter. The, yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, the, says, the aliens look alike too. Yeah, yeah, that, that. And one of the aliens originally gave Betty a book to calm her down. And oh like when God. they were leaving the spaceship again, he had to take it away from her because he said his higher ups uh, disavowed of this action. So he wanted mm. her to keep the book, but he couldn't. The corporate has restricted this book from your access. Sorry. And the alien's home planet was called El Sevier. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't it Ceta Reticuli? No, that's the home star. Yeah, but there, there yeah, yeah. It, it must no, be. I mean, no, no known exoplanet around Ceta Reticuli, but maybe this El Sevier. <laughs> anyways, anyways. So they gave her the blue book. And say, do you have time to read about our Lord? <laughs> Anyways, and then they gave the lady a tour of their UFO. It, it was a like saucer, saucer shaped object with a central superstructure. So maybe there was like a central dome inside that they walked in. So like they toured the UFO, and then of course these aliens were nice, but they were like chaotic good because actually she was like. Uh, examined with a variety of instruments, including something she called a cleaning device. As one of the aliens, like even though they were very gentle, like the alien stuck a needle into her nose and then into her navel. Oh, do you yeah. have a sphere of na needles? What did, did you ask me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have uh, a sorry, sphere, of, sphere of needles? I used to as a kid, but nowadays not really. Like when I go to the doctor and to get like a vaccine, I generally don't feel scared. Boy, you're so lucky. I got the worst, worst case of needle phobia. Like even in like a film when someone's shooting up heroin or something, I cannot look at, like, I have to be like physically, I will tell me to, tell me when it's over. Anyways, so they stuck a needle into her navel uh, and the book says it was a test for procreation. I guess she was uh, fertile enough with seven children, don't you think? Yeah. That... <laughs> Alien Objin Clinic. And then afterwards, Betty put her clothes back on and like they put her into something like the Pope Mobile. That is to say, like she was sitting in a chair, but it was surrounded by a glass uh, cube or something. And then I gave her a sweet drink. And then there were two other beings with silver luminous suits and black hoods. So they were like cultist aliens. I don't know. I guess she never saw their faces. So she sat on the glass chair and with these cult cultists, they went into a black stone tunnel. They go through a, they went through a mirror-like door and came out in a place with a vibrating red atmosphere. Maybe they passed through something like the Stargate. I don't know. It really sounds something like that has taken place. 
So the and then they followed the black track and went between two square buildings with window-like openings. And in this red place, which they accessed through the mirror-like gate, all over those buildings, there were these frog aliens crawling like... And then, so they were like monkeys or lemurs. So they had full bodies with arms and legs. And they had like arms and legs with like sucker-like limbs. But... The most scary of them all, they did not have any heads. In fact, they had like two uh, big eye stalks coming up from their chests. No head, no face, no mouth. Just those two snorkels with the with the kind of weird, uh, weird eyes. So that was it. She was very scared. She did not like these aliens. So her tour guides took her to a green realm full of plant life and water. And then she saw a gigantic bird in there because it was the green greenhouse planet. And then, like a phoenix, the bird turned into ash. No other detail is given. Then at 10.44, she came home from this amazing LSD-fueled trip. And then she had many experiences like that, but she interpreted this as an angelic experience. Now, wow, lots to unpack there. I mean... Once again, I think this is like a journey into the subconscious rather than uh, travel to another planet. Yeah, it sounds very dreamlike. Very, very dreamlike. It's almost like these, like, um, Through the Gates, uh, the, the Dream Quest of the Unknown Kadat by H.P. Lovecraft or uh, The Silver Key, like one of those stories. Like for our, for our listeners, I'll just summarize that Lovecraft wrote these horror books, but He also wrote these like never-ending journey stories, which are among my favorite Lovecraft stories, where this hero goes from like one tunnel to another realm and there's a monster there, there's a bird there. Like It's still a bit grim dark, but it's not a horror story per se. It's just journeys through endless worlds. And that's what I like about this story. What do you think, Timur? Yeah, it sounds very... Yeah, like you said, it sounds like a dream journey. And also, <laughs> like she says, like... An, angelic like a religious experience you could say Which i mean it's the kind of thing that i that i've already said in the last episode with adamski that i don't know some of these alien stories seem like modern replacements for uh, you know those old stories where someone said oh i saw the virgin mary on that hill and then they built a church there mm-hmm. true true I also think like uh, in many of these cases, especially about this Andrea Son story and especially with Adamski, uh, Adamski stories, like these guys or gals, these people, they, they, they were in on the stuff, you know, they actually made the plan to, it, they actually had a media plan. They first came out with these fantastic stories. There's this kind of press, uh, press popularity. First, it gets reported in newspapers and every newspaper picks up the story. And then these people publish their books and then they publish sequels to those books. And, you know, then they have a media empire. I mean, it's like Harry Potter, Bish Bash Bosh. Well, what do you think? But it sounds like in many of these cases, especially with this Betty Andreasson story, it's like they knew what they were doing. It's like a clearly planned, very well-oiled media business machine. In operation. Yeah, it could be. Like, yeah. I mean, there's some people where I genuinely do believe that they believe that they experienced something. It doesn't mean they did experience something, but I can see, like, a genuineness. Oh, yeah, her, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, I know what you mean. I don't know enough about her, but, for example, like, Whitley Strieber, reading his stuff, it does sound like he genuinely did does think that this stuff happened to him. He does, but then again, he was like a... Yeah, he was also a sci-fi, sci-fi writer. writer. Yeah. But and that... it's, it's all a case of how how deep you want to go in with the verisimilitude. Because I think like someone like you and I, if we like turned really like chaotic evil, we could create these stories too. And nobody would be wiser about it. In fact, I am doing that. Imagine, like, ah, 
Well, you you blown your game. You shouldn't have confessed. Yeah, the, the droid gong has <laughs> this night come into my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, t- tonight my adventure of discovery is about to commence. I mean, did I have a love affair with Snorky? Find out ne- on the next episode of Dragon <laughs> Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's lots of money waiting to be made from like an OnlyFans account where like there's like really sexy girl, but there's no porn only stuff. Gongs. But, yeah, only gongs. But also like she's like really like hot, very well dressed. But all all they do is like like there's nothing sexual. They just start this endless stories about UFO abduction. And there's another money making money making plan for uh like you know. So I saw these like meme ones of like <laughs> naked girls on Pornhub, but they're just sitting there reading like communist books, like The Conquest oh. of Red by this anarchist <laughs> author. I forgot his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really similar, but uh, I guess more empowering for uh, the 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 hosts since they're on OnlyFans, and I don't know, I don't know these are like hairy areas. I don't want to go too deep into. Oh, but. Anyways, but certainly, I mean, I could see, like, imagine it's 1960s, okay, there's no internet, like, people are far more susceptible than, like, especially, like, in our, in our internet age, it's like everybody has been to a degree vaccinated against uh, bullshit, like, even the QAnon people, like, they can at least, like, make the argument saying that, you know, what I experienced was the truth, and you are lying, but, but back in those days, uh, a great majority of people just believe that if so- they read something on the paper, it must be true. It's just fascinating in that respect. Oh, anyways. I, I forgot what I wanted to say. Well, we are all a bit uh, brain addled, aren't we? From the green paralysis ray. Yeah, we haven't even talked about the weirdest aliens, they like those slime balls that attack people, or or the oh. the one in the one in Venezuela where like one guy has like a knife fight with those little monkey aliens. Whoa. Maybe we should save them up for a follow up, and yeah, like exactly. we, we could go with this format. Uh, like, so there will be a part two of this series, ladies and gents. Uh, so thanks for uh, thanks for hanging in with us, and we hope you enjoyed enjoyed this podcast. Now, I think uh, both Timur and I, I, mean, I certainly, 32 degrees in here. I've gone into uh, glucose deficiency, like, my brain is about to shut down. I'm about to have a other out-of-body experience, and I guess uh, you're a bit tired, too, so uh, before saying goodbye, any, any, last, any last points to add for your projects, like, any new developments, Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, I've updated a bit on uh, Hardeshur, which is this Mars speculative evolution project. There is <laughs> new stuff coming out for Rhinia. Yep, yep. The links are in the video description, everyone. And, yeah, like if anyone like anyone has ideas for what we could talk about in like future episodes, please just comment it underneath this video. I'm really yep, interested yep, to hear yep. the ideas. Like, Last time someone commented, uh, like, asked you if you could talk about isopods. And I thought that was oh. an interesting idea because, you know, Bob, the other author of Rhinia, he's an isopod expert. I think he even wrote, like, a paper on them. Oh, yes. Actually, when I read that comment uh, recommending me to do an episode on isopods or recommending us, I wanted to do this, like, uh, big uh, every clade reviewed review of the isopod group. But they're just so fucking diverse, like, almost yeah. like insects. Yeah, like I I'm... thought that I could maybe get Bob to help you out with that. Well, no, no, I, I, I did the preliminary research. Of course, like a family tree of isopods would be very welcome. But it's so much work. And it's all made more complicated because like even a single group has like five or six different species that are extremely charismatic and they all need to be reviewed. So... I'm just putting a hold on that for now, but uh, maybe in the future. 
Now I, all, I've got at least on YouTube, I got the frog cryptids and aliens uh, mega review cooking up. And it should be ready within a few weeks, I hope. Nice. And also, uh, you got this amazing uh, pen, really, that uh, you showed me earlier this week. I was just captivated by it. It's this, uh, like, a lot of our viewers are interested in art and speculative evolution illustration. So uh, maybe you'd like to, like, we're not yeah. get, getting paid by this company at all, by the way. But... Yeah, the companies. Like I do most of my drawings in like a stifling fashion. It's very similar to like the old paleo art books by John C. Mm-hmm. McLaughlin. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. recently I got this as a gift from my girlfriend. Uh, it's by a company called Catalola. I think it's a Japanese company. And it's an electric stifling pen. Maybe if I, maybe the, wow. maybe the people can hear it when I hold it up to the camera when I activate it. Do you hear that? No, nothing. Okay. But it's an amazing device. So if you do this pointillism or stifling technique with little dots trying to create this, like, basically think of the image in terms of uh, fields and not in terms of lines. Like, I really like this technique, but uh, doing, like, dot, 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 dot with the hand just gives me freaking carpal tunnel syndrome. And, in fact, I mean, it's a really nice thing. And, I mean, man, uh, I that's how you know she's a keeper, by the way. Like, your girlfriend, go get married in the town hall tomorrow. I mean, it's really amazing that someone finds such a nice present for you that's so in line with uh, what you do. Yeah, so it's not I like love a... her so much. Uh, I had a you similar... probably listen to this. Uh, so, uh, hello, honey. <laughs> I love you. I had a similar... So, uh, sweet... I had a similar experience when I first met my wife and I told her, like, I, I'm an artist, I'm painting. And next week she had a business trip to Germany and then she came back with a, basically a suitcase full of extreme high quality sketchbooks and paper. And I still use that today. So that's that's how you know she's a keeper. So really nice. And that's like this Catalola product, which uh, the, it's in the video description, by the way. Uh, go look it up. I really recommend it. In fact, I think like uh, if any of you we will get me in with the Lola company, just let them know I can do a free product review. <laughs> uh, uh, I got you know almost thirty five thousand subs now. Everybody is like uh, extremely invested. This channel has like the one of the best like dislike ratios ever, like close to ninety nine point nine percent. And everybody weaving is at least in some ways interested in art and science. So Catalola, if you want to have a sponsorship deal, just let me know. Okay. You just, if you do get sponsored, we have to be careful about what you talk about in future episodes. Oh, like I don't know, like so, like the the alien abduction council include rape probably have to be uh, scrapped. You will have to cancel the entire season yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways anyways it's been a great great talk thanks thanks to timur thank you for your time and thank you for this yeah. uh great uh show we this will be a regular now we next time you see us hopefully we will be talking like continuing to talk about weird aliens and then after that we'll find something new to talk about uh, please follow us and donate to Timur on Patreon if you want to see my special drawing of the snorkel alien on the rooftop. And as always, have a nice day. And also be sure to support Memo, of course, on his Patreon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Yeah, I guess the recording is wrapped. Uh, no way. <laughs> I still have to oh. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.